Welcome to the physics section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 1 to 5. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 1, question 2, 3, 4, and 5. So now that you guys have attempted the questions, let's go through them all together. In question one, it says, assuming three identical blocks are released from the same height on frictionless inclines of different angles, which block will be traveling fastest when it reaches the bottom? So we have three identical blocks and they're released from the same height. And then we're told that the machine is frictionless and they're of differing angles. So because the machines are frictionless, we don't have to worry about any friction. Just, just consider the speed at which they're traveling at the bottom. So which one will be traveling fastest? So in this case, we need to look at each of these blocks and then consider the, the speed at which they're traveling when they reach the bottom of the incline. So we have three blocks, which one's traveling the fastest? Option D is saying all of them are traveling at the same speed. Okay, so do they all travel at the same speed or at different speeds? Well, first of all, to figure out how fast they're traveling when they reach the bottom, we have to see how much energy these blocks have and so the main energy which they had at the beginning that they converted into speed was gravitational potential energy because they were they were higher up they were at the top of an incline and then when they came down they lost that gravitational potential energy and it got converted to a different type of energy so to figure out how much gravitational potential energy they had we use this equation mgh so their mass times gravity times height and then multiply and then it is equal to their kinetic energy at the bottom, which is half, let me just redo that, half mv squared. So their gravitational potential energy becomes their kinetic energy. And the main thing that you need to keep in mind is that for all three of them, m is the same because they're identical blocks. Of course, g is the same as well. And then we're told in the question that they're released from the same height meaning that h is the same as well. So it doesn't matter the fact that these blocks are at different angles, that the inclines are at different angles, that doesn't matter. As long as you're released from some height and then you make it to the bottom and then there is no friction, if there was like a difference in coefficient of friction in the three inclines and there might be a different answer, but because there's no friction, all we are really considering is that a block is released from one height and then it reaches the bottom, what is it, its speed? Well, they all started with the same energy, therefore, they all are going to have the same speed. So the same V at the end, the same velocity. Therefore, option D is correct. In question two, it sees a person is pushing a box against a wall in order to keep it from sliding down. The force applied is directly perpendicular to the wall, which is perfectly vertical. Now, if the coefficient of static friction is 0.65, how much force must be applied to the box to prevent it from sliding? So let's say we have a wall and we have a box against it. Someone is pushing it with this force F. We have to figure out how much force that is. So coefficient of static friction is 0 0.5. And then we want to figure out how much force has to be applied. So going to the left. So one force which is definitely acting on the box is its weight, so its mass times gravity. That force is the one that is pulling it down. And the one opposing that is going to be our force of friction. And so one more force is present here. That is the normal force. So that is the force that the wall is pushing against back to the, the box. And then it's the force that counteracts the force that the person is applying. And so we have to figure out this force, force F. If the coefficient of static friction is this much, how much force must be applied to the box to prevent it from sliding? So force F is the one which seems to be opposing the normal force in this case. So that means that if we find out what the normal force is, we can find out what force F is as well. And then we know that the force of friction and the normal force are related because the force of friction 
is just equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force. And in this case, it's 0 0.65 times the normal force. And then we also know that the force of friction is equal to the weight because the box is not moving anywhere. That is in equilibrium vertically. And so the force of friction is also equal to mg, which is the weight. And then finally, we can say that now 0.65n is also equal to mg because that's just that's just a force of friction and so now we can just rearrange for n n is equal to mg over 0 0.65 so that is what n is equal to right here and that's the same thing as what f must be equal to as well because f has to equal n for this whole system to be an equilibrium and so it's not moving anywhere and so the box is held against the wall and that matches up with option a now in question three it says a three kilogram block is initially at rest on a frictionless horizontal surface the block is then moved eight meters in two seconds by the application of a 12 newton horizontal force what is the average power developed while moving the block so we know that a block has moved eight meters and then in two seconds, and then we have a 12 Newton force. We're asked, what is the power? So for power, you should know that the equation is the work done over time, which is the same thing as force times distance over time. So work is the same as force times distance. In this case, we do not care that we have a three kilogram block. That's not relevant to us. It doesn't plug anywhere into our equation, but we do use everything else. So we have 12 newtons multiplied by 8 meters and then that all took place in 2 seconds when you plug all of that in and solve you should get 48 watts so C is our correct answer over here in question 4 it says a 50 kilogram object rests on a 45 degree incline what coefficient of static friction would be required to keep the object from moving. So 50 kilogram object, it's on a 45 degree incline, and then we want to know the coefficient of static friction. So to figure that out, let's just draw it. We have our incline like this, and we have a box resting on top of it, okay? The two main forces acting on it, first of all, of course, is the weight, which we'll just write right now as, well, it's the weight. The weight, was, which is also equal to mg, and then going this way is the normal force. So the normal force is always perpendicular to whatever incline the box is on. So that's the normal force. And then the force which is counteracting that normal force. So... This is theta. Theta, in this case, is equal to 45. The force, which is counteracting the normal force, is going to be mg cos of theta. So mg cos of theta is counteracting the normal force. If we want this box to not be moving and to be in complete equilibrium, mg cos theta has to be the same as the normal force, and then that is cancelled out, and then the component which is moving the box down the incline is the x component of gravity and so therefore that's going to be mg sine theta so this component of gravity is pulling the box downwards and so therefore the thing which will pull the box backwards and prevent it from going down the incline has to be the force of friction which has to counteract mg sine theta. So we want to know what is the force of friction to block the object from moving. So if the object doesn't move, then the force of friction has to equal mg sine theta. If these two are equal, 
then the box is not going to move anywhere. We can already assume that the normal and mg cos theta are equal and the box is not moving anywhere up and down. It's really just left and right that we're worried about, meaning left and right, like going down the incline or going up the incline. So to make it, to prevent it from going down the incline, the friction force has to be the same as the component of gravity pulling it down the incline. And so that's how we get this equation. Force of friction is equal to mg sine theta. And then force of friction, that is always just the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So that's equal once again to mg sine theta. And then we said that the normal force is equal to mg cos of theta. So once again, keep in mind that theta here is 45 degrees. Now we can isolate for the coefficient of friction, which is what we were asked to find in the question. And then I'll just plug in the actual angle now. It's 45 degrees. So mg sine theta divided by mg cos theta, theta being 45. So the mg cancels out. And then if you know your special triangles, the sine of theta is the same as the cos of theta. So this equation cancels out pretty neatly for us. And so the main answer we get is just one. So the coefficient of static friction required for this question is going to be one. So you didn't even need the fact that it's a 50 kilogram object. You really just needed the degrees of the incline. So A is the correct answer for this question. In question five, we're asked which of the following does not correctly represent power. So not correctly represent power. So for this, looking at all of these equations, we're talking about power in terms of this equation. So P equals IV, that is an equation for power that is pretty important. And so you should have it memorized for the MCAT. That matches up with C. So C is not the correct answer for this question. So that that one is an actual representation of power. So make sure you have that one in mind. And then you should also know that V is equal to IR. And so if you have these two equations, you can just plug them into each other. So if V is equal to IR, if I plug that in for V, I can say that, so plugging in for V, P is equal to I times IR, which is the same thing as I squared R. If I plug in for, so if V is equal to IR, that means I is equal to V over R. And that also means that R is equal to V over I. So plugging in for I now, P is equal to V over R times V which is equal to V squared over R. And then plugging in for R. Well, R is not even in the P equals IV equation, so we don't even need to plug in for R. But when we plugged in for V, we got P is equal to I squared R, which is the same thing as A. So that one is a representation of power. When we plugged in for I, we got P is equal to V squared over R. So that's the same thing as D and then therefore B must be the incorrect representation because B or option B is saying P is equal to I R squared over V. If I plug in for R squared, like that just doesn't even work out. If I plug in, let's say V over here, so I'm taking this and I'm plugging that in over here for option B, I get P is equal to IR squared over IR. And so that will cancel out once and the I is gone. And now it's just P is equal to R and that's 
incorrect. P is not equal to R. It should have somehow become, again, P is equal to IV, or P is equal to I squared R, or something like this. But P is equal to R, that's incorrect. And so the one in option B, P is equal to I R squared over V, that is not a correct representation of power. So for this equation, or for this question, just know these two main equations and then be able to substitute them into each other. That's it for the questions in this video. If you liked what you saw in this video and you want to see more, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. In that, we go through a lot more questions and then go through all the different answer options and explain what's right and what's wrong and why it is that. And so if you are interested in that, make sure to check out our course. The link should be in the description below. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.